I am excited to announce my new podcast, Giving Legends. It's an opportunity for me, Hannibal Navies, and my co-host, Charlie Batch, to talk with people of influence who are committed to building a legacy through service. Stay tuned and learn what makes them Giving Legends. What's going on? Welcome to another edition of Giving Legends Podcast. I'm Charlie Batch, joined by my co-host, Mr. Hannibal Navy. What's up, Charlie? <laughs> What's going on? And today we have an exciting show. We have an entrepreneur, philanthropist, Super Bowl champion, and the newest edition of the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame, Mr. Dion Grand. How you doing, sir? What's going on, my brother? D Jizzle. <laughs> How y'all doing? D Jizzle. We good, man. man congratulations, good. man. That is awesome, man. Big time congratulations to the Hall of Fame. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I know growing up in Augusta, what does that mean to you when you turn around and now have it all come full circle to be inducted to the Georgia Hall of Fame? You know, I think it's big for my community. You know, um, my heart is always reaching out and trying to touch my community and the youth that's coming up under me. So, um, you know, being somewhere where it's sustained and they can always go and, you know, come and visit here and go to Macon and visit you know, the Hall of Fame and making and see my name there and know that I come from exactly where they come from, you know, give them the the hope and the energy, you know, to push forward and be, you know, dedicated to whatever they want in their future. And when you talk about, we all have dreams at that early age and you get to that point, you have the hope and yeah, I mean, at what point did you think that there may be a chance as you were growing up? <sighs> To be honest with you, I've, I've been winning ever since I was a kid, from Pop Warner to middle school to high school, winning championships on every level. But I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't see it coming out of my my community, so I just thought it was just part of winning. But um, I never thought that I had a chance to like, make it on the next level until I left. When it was time for me to go to college, even though I had all you know, all the colleges there um, you know, coming in the, in, in the neighborhood I stayed in, sitting, you know, sitting on my couch, I still just thought this is something normal. Um, I ain't going to nobody college. And then when I passed the SAT and, you know, signed on a dotted line that I'm going to Tennessee, I was like, I'm really leaving out the city to go away from the family. And even when I was in college, I just thought, you know, playing, even though we had all these greats to come before me, the Paynes, the Reggie Weiss, the Dale Carters, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, still just thought, you know, just going to play for college until, you know, my roommate and myself had a conversation. And we said, we have a good year. We come out early. And it was like a foreign language to me. And I'm like, come out early. And we just had won, won a national championship that year. So my mind totally switched and, you know, I got focused on, you know, just trying to be the best player I can be, um, to get myself in a position to in the NFL and had the opportunity to do that. So I really didn't believe it until that moment happened every time. So it's it's no small feat, man, to to get into the Georgia Hall of Fame and the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame and the Georgia Football Hall of Fame, right? We know all the Georgia boys that come out of Georgia, man. You guys have a long history of sports, but you've been able to accomplish that. You've won a Super Bowl. You won a national championship. You've been to two Super Bowls, won one Super Bowl. What does that mean now when you go back? How do people perceive you? Has it changed when you go back to where you from growing up in the hood, where we, you know, where you come from in the different areas where you grew up, did it change your perspective and how they, how they approach you and how they looked at you? Um, I, I never, I left physically as far as, you know, the three years that I was in college and then, you know, the 12 years that I played, but I always came back. So they always feel like I was still there mm -hmm. with them. And every time I came, I, I, I never just, you know, had the flashy things and waved it in their face. Every time I came back, I always did something for the community. If it was giving out clothes, giving out um, shoes, if it was putting events together in the neighborhoods, and that that wasn't only in Augusta, it was also in Atlanta, and you know, you know, us playing together in Carolina. It was in every city that I played mm -hmm. on the NFL team with. But when I went went back home, even when I come back here in Atlanta, the neighborhood that I'd adop I adopted here. It was normal because I never left. You know, mm -hmm. I never disconnect from them. So if I was in Seattle, it still we was on the phone 24-7. Mm -hmm. I knew what was going on in the neighborhood, so I knew how to approach it. And I know you have an affinity for, you know, your community. Wherever you wherever you live, you find a community, you find the inner city and, and, the, and the people that are underprivileged, whether it was Charlotte, whether it was Seattle, New York. 
you know, here in Atlanta, obviously this is this is your your stomping grounds where you grew up. But why is that? You know what I mean? I've, I've known you for a very long time. I know things about you, but our, our audience doesn't know everything. Like why is that part of your DNA? You know, why why is that? Because obviously you're here because you do more than just play football, right? You have a brand because you play football, so you do more than just that. But why is that something that you've always made a priority in your life? Hmm. My mom asked the same question, and we used to get into it. She's like, dude, why you keep going to that neighborhood knowing they just had a killing, knowing they just had ABC? And, and I'm like, you know, God is my protector. You know, he put it on my heart, and that's my peace. Mm. You know, my peace can be going in the neighborhood and having a conversation with a couple of the youngins and taking them out and just showing them something that I didn't experience and they can see that it's a better life than what they're living. You know, it give them that hope, you know, um, give them that motivation to do something different. And, you know, this guy came from the same area that I came from and walked the same walk that I'm walking, that um, it's something on the other side of that fence. So I, if I had to answer that, I would say, um, it give me that peace. Mm. And I know as you go through it and every, the neighborhood is excited, taking you through that journey, championship after championship. And then all of a sudden you're hit with some resiliency and you get to that point in Carolina, everybody's excited about it. And all of a sudden, probably something that hasn't happened to you before you were injured. Mm. And when you get to that point of your first year getting injured, take me through that mindset, going through the rehab and then what shaped you and what you now are able to play another additional 11 seasons. Oh man, you know, it was it was a bittersweet situation because um coming out I came out of college early. I was, you know, projected to go, you know, top fifteen. Things happen off the field. Um even on, you know, combine, not being guided the right way. So I kind of messed my situation up uh, for the draft. So when I fell and seeing my buddies, my, my roommate, um, and all them guys going first round, um, and I didn't get picked into the second round, uh, it was like a bit of sweet. So I had a, a point to prove. So when I went to Carolina, you know, they were showing so much love, but I was so, I was happy for the opportunity, but I was so upset at the same time because I felt like I should have been drafted higher. Um, but when I got there, I was just on a mission. And, you know, from many camps, pardon me, from many camps to training camps, you know, I just work, work, and end up moving up to that star position. And first day when they said, D, you going to be the starter, and we're going against um, Detroit, you know, I broke it. But I just want to say that I built a, a relationship when I first got there with Hannibal. And him and I was tight, and I'm like, I couldn't even really be hurt while I was hurt in the hospital because he trying to be hurt with me. I go to the hospital after I break my hip and I'm in the hospital. When I wake up, I see him come in the hospital in a wheelchair. I'm like, this man would not leave my yeah, side, man. man. But no, uh, but um, you know, it was, like I said, it was a bittersweet moment, but that that was really a, a gut check. Um, and you know, while we while we on that and we going through this whole process of, you know, winning championship after championship and, you know, winning SEC player, defense player, the other other stuff and then coming and that happened. Um, Miss Mr. Richardson that have passed, mm -hmm. um, that was the owner at the time. Um, I always when I tell this story, I have to bring this up, even though this is off to uh, off topic, but when I broke my hip and I was in, you know, the ambulance about to go, you know, go to the helicopter, get flew to Charlotte to the hospital, you know, and you talking about a billionaire that's a owner of this team. It got, well, how many guys you have in training camp? Like a hundred. Yeah. So you got all these guys in training camp and this man is in the ambulance with me rubbing my feet, just trying to keep me calm while I'm blanking in and out. Mm. And um, I always want to say that because, you know, um, I didn't get a chance to really express the appreciation and everything why he was here. So he didn't get a chance to smell them roses. So if his family was there, able to watch that, just to, you know, take my hat off to how great of a man he was, for mm -hmm. not only giving me the opportunity, but how he was there to support me and some of the other things he did while I was going through um, the injury, trying to recover. But um, to get back on topic, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it was hard. It was hard because, you know, you have a doctor come in and tell you um, your career is over with. You never walk the same, um, run the same, you know, get you to walk the same, but nobody never came back from this injury. You hear, you, you hearing all this stuff about it. What This is what ended Bo Jackson's injury, um, career. Um, and, you know, had a great coach, DB coach, as far as Coach Maynard that told me, you know, he saw me come in the locker room on crutches a lot earlier than I supposed to came back. And he was like, it's like four to six months within after I hadn't been in the hospital for about almost a month. And um, he was like, do you hear on crutches already? He said, now, if you come back next year and you're able to run, you started. He was joking because he knew that it was over with. At least they said it was over with. Um, and that was my goal. And I came back the next year. Then um, I was running, and I earned that starting position before the season started, and I started every game for the rest of my career. Hmm. I would like to thank United Charitable for sponsoring today's Giving Legends podcast. United Charitable is a national nonprofit that focuses on guiding you on your charitable journey. Whether you like to simply streamline your giving or you like to create your own charitable initiative, United Charitable has the knowledge and resources to support you. If you'd like to learn more, check out the link in our bio. Yeah, I remember that time, DG. I mean, I, I literally got hurt the same. We playing the Lions. Charlie Bass was even there. Charlie was playing the Lions in training camp in Spartanburg. And I remember watching you go down. He was my boy. I was like, I was just, in my head, I was just so dis disappointed and, and hurt by you being hurt. Like, man, my dude is hurt. Very next practice, my knee goes out. I'm in the same hospital with you, yeah. rolling there, talking to you. But I remember that time. But I remember also we both had that, that's the first time we ever had time off from football. And it was adversity. First time I had ever gotten, you know, really hurt yeah. my, myself. What did you do at that time? And, and how did that kind of play into your, your next steps of your career? I start, I, to be honest with you, I started studying the NFL. Mm -hmm. I know that sound, how you study the NFL, but I started looking at it from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, I started having people, I had like a couple of people call me on some selfishness, um, trying to say his career with him, see if we can get a little bit of signing mm -hmm. bonus money out of him. And um, it made me just take a step back, you know, with all the support I had in the hospital room. But them phone calls made me take a step back and just understand the NFL and understand it's a business and how I'm going to have to take care of myself. And the healthier, the healthier I can be, um, the longer my career is going to be. So um, that's how I approached it from that point on. Mm. So it, 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 it was a hurt, but it helped me out also because I was moving fast. Yeah. You know, I was moving fast, even though I was a guy that never drank, never smoked, and all the other stuff. But like you said, I found the community in every city that I stayed in. And uh, sometimes, and, and at that age, you have all this money, you know, you can be caught up in the wrong situations in them communities. And I think I was on that path because I didn't totally disconnect. So um, I think the injury actually helped me out a lot because it slowed me down mentally and let me take a step back to understand what the NFL is about. And I think when you go through that and all of the work that you have to kind of put through that, and then as your career goes on, all the accolades start to come individually. And then the one that's missing is that team moment. And when you finally get to that point, you're like, I have the opportunity. And you get to the, the big game and you get to that Super Bowl and you finally win that game and be part of that. Take me through that. What was that mindset like when you were able to hoist that Lombardi trophy? Um, so, you know, going in Carolina, I'm still young. Fourth year in the NFL, you know, Carolina is a new franchise. Uh, we're playing in Houston, you know. I'm trying to be out at every event. <laughs> <laughs> every event they paying me at, I'm trying to be there. Um, and that was my focus to enjoy this. You know, we didn't have guys on the team, that many guys that had done won the Super Bowl or experienced the Super Bowl. So we didn't have no experience at all. And we played New England that had already won one or two. I can't remember how many they won by 2004, 2003, 2004. But um, I remember that the moments when we went to Indy when I was in New York. Um, and I said, I'm going to do the total opposite. I'm going to focus. You know, every night that we hear after practice, I'm going to come back, I'm going to eat with the fam, and then I'm going to focus on, you know, what 
Tom Brady them is going to give us. And um, it was so much smoother. I was I had a chance to really enjoy the game. The first the first experience I didn't have a chance to enjoy because I was all over the place uh, from an immature standpoint. But that second go round, it was the best feeling in the world. Mm. It was the best feeling, and then having the opportunity to do it in one of my buddies that I played against in high school that had them won a couple already, Deion Branch. They have him in the end zone as we knock the ball down and he right there and all the confetti is coming down. And, um, you know, my brother just waiting while everybody else then ran in from his team. He waiting just to congratulate me. You know, it was a, a, priceless, mom a priceless moment. Um, you know, I can't even put it in words, but it, it, it was definitely amazing. <laughs> That's one of those things that I always experience. You yeah. know, I remember when that confetti is coming down, you know, you, you had to have a chance to hoist that Lombardi trophy. But as you go Super through Bowl it. Talk. I can't believe it. It's okay. <laughs> if I try to hear it, yes. I remember, I remember when I had the confetti follow me too. Like, you might try to hear that, man. So, so those are all exciting moments, but it kind of gets you there, you know, until, but, you know, it makes you appreciate yeah. kind of those steps it takes to kind of get to those moments because you're celebrating that and you're doing it as a team. Yes. And those are the things that are, are important. But there also comes a time as you're going through that, you think, okay, I'm starting to kind of get to that end of the career. What is that end of the career going to look like for me? At what point did you know kind of starting? I'm playing one of my last two downs. Maybe your body is telling you that you can't do it as much anymore. And then figuring out kind of what's next as you start that transition process for yourself. Well, I hadn't started that transition process before that. And be honest with you, that year, I said, you know, if I don't win, I had told, you know, one of my buddies, Antrea Rose, I told him, bro, if I don't win the Super Bowl, I'm, I'm done regardless. So that was our goal. You know, he he he, he made it his business that, the, you know, we're going to pull a, a little extra energy to make sure that our brother be sent out the right way. Um, and he was, him and I think Mike Bowling was the only two that I had that conversation with. But um, I already had done started. You know, I was mean with my CPA. I was mean with my financial advisors and making sure everything was already lined up. So um, when that happened, and I, I think I was getting tired of having surgeries. And my body is so weird that I would have a major surgery and I'd be able to rehab it and still come back and be healthy enough to start the season. And I had, I think I had, what, like nine surgeries at this point even though I had like one, one or two after the season's mm -hmm. over with, but it was from an injury from mm -hmm. me playing. And I knew I had to get bone spurts taken out. And I said, if I have to have another surgery also, I'm not playing no more. And I knew I had to have another surgery after that particular season. Um, but it was smooth. I went out on my own terms. Um, I still had an opportunity to return uh, for a couple of teams, and I just didn't want to, you know. I didn't want to, and I was comfortable with that, so... It make it a lot easier now when I watch the game that I can watch the game and enjoy it versus watching the game and feel like I still have something left that I need to prove. Mm. Yeah, you, you've transitioned, you know, like I said, I, I know and I've seen a lot that you do from the entrepreneur side, right? You're, you're a great businessman. A lot of people don't know that as well. You have a lot of different businesses and and, and do a lot with entrepreneurship and in, in that part. But obviously you're here because you're a given legend. Your, your legacy has been cemented as we talked about you know, being in the Hall of Fame in Georgia and things like that, that stuff will never go away. So you do have a legacy there and you're a legend, but you're on the show because I've seen your legacy of giving that you've been doing since the day that I met you, right? So what is, you know, tell me a little bit about what you do. You're, you're not the atypical kind of uh, philanthropist that I, that I kind of come across. You, you don't do it for the media. You don't do it for the articles that are written about you, people don't even know half the time you do it. I get on you all the time. Like, yeah. why you didn't tell me that you was having this event and doing all this good stuff, right? Me and Charlie do that with you all the time. Yeah. So, you know, you obviously do it for your own personal reasons, but, you know, tell me a little bit about what you do and why you do it that way. You don't, you know, you, I don't see you fundraising. I see you funding it yourself. I see you just can, can, just doing the work, right? You just do the work. You don't worry about, you know, all these other things. Obviously you have a 501c3 set up, but talk to me a little bit about what you do um, and, and why you do it the way you do it? I think I, I never got comfortable with, um, and I have to separate this, you know, we, we can speak about me being this good entrepreneur, but then again, I get in my own way mm. that look like I'm not a good when it comes to, you know, the philanthropy part of it, um, with my foundation. I just hate to ask people for things. Mm. 
I hate to ask people. I've been like that growing up, um, but I know it's bigger than me. And that's the part that I need to figure out how to get out of my way. But um, the reason why, you know, I've been doing this since I got in the league. Um, I used to go and just put money together and go to different neighborhoods. Like, for an example, if I think my first event was um, in my community that was very violent at the time. And, you know, we was going to war with another community. And I got all the communities that was going to war with one another. And I said, you know, I'm going to put together a basketball tournament, like a Rucker Park mm-hmm. situation. I call it the Hood to Hood Classic at the time. I got a DJ, paid a DJ, got it, went and bought a lot of food, went and bought uniforms. And then I put also a gift prize together. Um, and I said, you know, this is a way that we can put the guns and just come together. And, you know, I didn't even have um, a police officer out there to secure because the respect all the neighborhoods mm-hmm. have for me. And it was hundreds of people out there. And I did it for a few years. And um, from that point on, you know, I just continue to give. And I just came out my pocket. I said, if I have it, you know, this is my way of giving back. Um, this is the way God put it on me to tie. Mm. And um, and I enjoy doing it like that. Over the years, you know, I had somebody that was my exec. Um, and she, you know, went and got a couple of grants over the years for me. But for the most part, you know, w- whatever God put on my heart. And I met also a, a great friend of mine, Mita, Wonder Woman, um, that was doing big things in New York and Brooklyn. So I partnered with her a lot, you know, to, you know, if she had something going on, I would donate money or mm-hmm. donate my donate money in my time and also um, you know, travel doing it with her. But that's just always been you know, my mentality, you know, and then, you know, I got my foundation started and try to make it a little bigger with doing the mentorship program, scholarship giveaways, donating computers. I can go on and on. I think my goal now is to be like, you know, my mentor, big um, Charlie Batch and get me a center. I don't want no center like how he got in Pittsburgh, but get me a little small <laughs> center where the kids can, you know, come to and just, you know, broaden mm-hmm. they horizon i would like to thank athletes charitable for sponsoring today's given legends podcast athletes charitable offers a concierge membership service that provides the tools and resources to build a legacy through service our athlete-led team has the first-hand experience and expertise to provide hands-on support that simplifies the entire process for athletes and entertainers to reach their social entrepreneurship goals and create lasting impact in their communities to learn more check out the link in the bio You've done a lot of things over over the years, and we have a lot of former guys that are players that are listening to this. When we always talk about networking, and here you are from Augusta, you've been able to build relationships, Jacksonville, New York, Seattle. Talk about how important that is, and how it was instrumental in shaping your life as it relates to the relationships you've been able to build. Because not only are you doing it in Georgia, but you are doing it in multiple mm-hmm. cities. Talk a little bit about that for people who may want to try to implement. Uh, what you've been able to do. That's huge. Um, I know I got the worst advice when I first came in. Focus on football. You know, that's the worst. That's that's supposed to be automatic. You know, you should be able to focus on football in your sleep. You know, that's your job. Um, so it made a lot of us, and how you know this also, it made a lot of us turn away from business and, you know, your foundation, which is different now. Um, but me being in them cities and building them relationships in the community and also keeping a good face call with the teams. It allowed me to still go back and put events together with the teams. And if I want to get somebody, a donor or um, collab, collab with somebody, it makes it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a phone call. away. I can go to Seattle anytime because I, I partner with United Way and the YMCA's and everything else. And I left a good impression on them. And I kept my word and I made sure that if I said I was going to be somewhere, I was there. Mm -hmm. Um, So now, you know, if they say they want to pay me to come up there to do something or if they want me to connect with some kids, you know, because of the relationship we have, I won't even charge sometimes. You know, I would spend my own money and say, you know, if anything, if it's a flight that's crazy, you take care of the flight. But as far as paying me a fee, 
I do whatever need to be done um, to reach kids or to reach whatever community that I have built with in these different cities. So it's very important to make sure when you're making these connections at all these different events that you just leave that line of communication open and just check in and out with people. And speaking about, you know, building connections and things like that, when you talk about philanthropy, one of the things, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of players and people that want to get into philanthropy are going to listen to this. But philanthropy is not always starting a foundation and, and doing it that way, right? Giving back is not always that way. And I, and, I, and I learned that from you as well. You, and talk about collaboration thing, I mean, you, you gave back, if it, was, if it was your foundation, you showing up all over the country to, you came to 360, you've probably been to every 360 that I've had except for maybe one. I've seen you all over the country supporting Spikes and different people all over the country. This is what you were doing when you played. And even now when you're done, you go support people. So you give in other ways too, by giving your time. You have a brand and you give that time and that energy and that mentorship to all kind of other foundations. So talk about the importance of a professional athlete, their brand, not just having to sit and wait, but getting involved in supporting other causes. You know, I come from a family that outside of my immediate family, my mother, my sisters, my aunts, um, I didn't have a great support system, mm. you know. Um, my family didn't know anything about the professional living and how important it was growing up, didn't, didn't grow up with a father. So sometime at games, if my mom could come because she was working two or three jobs, she would make it. But um, I didn't realize how effective that was until as I got older mm. and I started diving into other people that felt comfortable with sharing their word and how they felt alone. And I say, you know, anytime my brothers reach out to me, you know, to support what they have going on and it's for a great cause, I'm going to make it my business to try and be there unless it's something that I can't make it because I already done committed to mm -hmm. something that's on the schedule. But I just feel like it's very important that we, you know, we build this brotherhood and we call each other family and everything else. But, you know, we always looking for the dollar to go and support somebody. And they just never been me. You know, and I don't have to broadcast that. That's never been my style. Only thing I feel bad about is that I haven't made it to Pittsburgh yet to support my brother Charlie. But um, and I'm making my business this year yeah, to do yeah. it. But um, that's just always been my goal, just to support my brothers. And I know that God put something different on my heart, and I know I always have a message that can reach some kid. And I don't mind going into them trenches that. Mm -hmm. Some guys just not gonna yeah. go into, you know, to you know, grab somebody's hand. So I think that's the main reason why I do it. And I think that's important, as as you know, Charlie and I talk about all the time, just supporting each other as professional athletes or as professionals. It's not just about the Hannibal Navy's Foundation or Deion Grant Foundation or Charlie Bassett, but it's how do we collaborate? How do we support each other? Because without that, you know, saying we don't can we can't increase the impact that we created. So I think it's super important when we talk about philanthropy, especially on the level of talking about as 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 professional athletes, right? I think more should happen, right? I think more of that should go on. Sometimes, like you said, they're not getting paid or it's the off season. They could be in Miami. They're not doing this. They're not, we're not supporting the way that we should. So I, I love the fact that you've always done that. And people are sitting on this couch, we've always done that. I think it's super important. I mean, you talk about it all the time. I mean, you you open your doors up at your foundation in Pittsburgh and you tell them like, listen, I'm here to help you. You know, I'm here to, to, to offer my support for what you got to do. So, I mean, I'm off to giving you the question, like how important is that collaboration as professional athletes to support each other's causes. No, it is, it is important because everybody's at different stages, right? So you kind of see where we're at 23 years, but you still have the infancy stages of where we're all trying to help people get through that and smooth some of those hurdles out, which leads us to this conversation that we're having. But when you talk about the support, it can be in many different levels because before you get to that point of foundation, people have to go through that transition. And we talk about that transition. We work together over the years, helping and finding these players where they're at. Dion, you're a trust captain. A lot of the things that are going on, and people who don't know, the trust is powered by the NFLPA. It was a collective bargaining that was started in 2013 and I was a part of with the negotiations to help bring it to fruition. Yeah. To get to the emphasy stages to where we are now after 10 years, over thousands and thousands of players that we've helped, now that you're kind of taking that point, it's one thing to leave from behind. People see you as leaders in multiple different locker rooms. Talk about some of those challenges as a trust captain that you're still seeing, maybe you went through, and maybe for people who are out there that are listening to you, where can they go for support? Because the trust is a very powerful program. Yes. Um, like you said, you know, what helped me be part of, you know, the trust and be one of the captains, having you as a senior captain, having him to run the show, reached out to me and, um, you know, putting together this event in Atlanta the first year. 
Um, it showed me that it's a lot of guys out there that need support. And it <laughs> spearhead go right back to what we we're just talking about, why I choose to travel and um, choose to be part of different teams um, for that support. And I saw that at that event. So when Hannibal asked me to be a part of the team, um, I just seen the bigger picture as far as I got to try my best, however long I'm going to be part of the trust, I got to try my hardest to get as much information I can get out there to the guys because I seen how much in need it was of the benefits that's out there for these guys that they definitely needed. Um, even when it comes to, you know, the mental part of it, having to deal with a couple of guys that was contemplating on committing suicide uh, and just being a part of that team to get him in a position that he need to be in for him to be as well as he is now, both of the guys. Um, that was just my goal, to be part of it, to let guys know that, you know, you have trust captains in all these different regions. Um, you have a place in D.C. where you, we could, you could pick up the phone and call and get as many resources that you need to get the benefits that you need. And um, just to let the guys know, take advantage and tap in because they're out there on the table. And like Charlie said, it was something that he was a part, part of getting into the collective bargain agreement. And if it's not utilized, you know, it won't stay on the table. And it's for us. And we earned it. You know, I told you I had nine surgeries. You know, that's part of me earning these benefits. And if you play one down, you know, within them two years, or you play no downs, you still was part of that foundation to help build and, and gain these benefits. So it's important for us to take advantage of them. Man, I, I think as we wrap up, man, uh, you know, the reason, one of the reasons we started giving legends was people like yourself. We want, because you ain't going to do it yourself, right? You know, because that's not the kind of person you are. But we... <laughs> We like highlighting, you know, people like you, what you're doing. I want I want more people to know what Deion Grant, what he's doing off of the outside of business, outside of football, right? Because we know all your accolades and that. But you quietly are doing more work in this country than a lot of people even know that you're doing. Like I said, you don't just do it here Thank in Atlanta. You. you do it everywhere you set your feet, right? I've literally seen you drive up to the hood and open your trunk and give away your clothes out your closet. I mean, I've, I've literally yeah. seen stuff you just wore in one time, right? I've seen you... We out to dinner and and see a single mom with her kid and just pay for the meal, right? I've seen you do all these different things, and so you know, glad to have you on the show, man, and and, and glad to highlight the giving legend in you and what you do. Tell us how we can support you and how the people listening can support your foundation. Tell us the name of your foundation and kind of how we can help you with that. Here we go. It's the struggling part. No, <laughs> the name of the foundation is Grant Foundation. Um, acronym Grant is greatness requires all necessary tools. Um, uh, social media is Grant Foundation, I think, underscore. And right now we're revamping the uh, website so I can get you that information. But, um, you know, anytime I have something going on, you know, just come out support. You know, I, I really, it's hard for me to ask for support from a monetary standpoint, but you know, physicalness is, is is great for me. Everything has to be taken care of if I put my name on it. Mm. And we appreciate you, man. You're doing great work. Like Hannibal said, man, as one brother to another, man, mm -hmm. big time. Congratulations on everything you're doing, man. We appreciate everything you're man, doing. I thank y'all, man. Then one brother to two others, man. Y'all definitely showing y'all got money, man. This is nice, <laughs> Stop man. it. Look, look at this. This is real saying, hey, nice, We ain't even going to start, you know. Jeez. Unzip your jacket a little bit. Man, let, me this, let me see that this, blend this you got is, on there, man. very Cut it nice, out. man. I'm, Cut I'm, it out, I'm, man. I'm, I'm proud of y'all brothers, man. You know, I'm always going to be here to support y'all, man, because y'all are two of the most supporting brothers, you know, that I built a relationship and we built that fraternity with. So I'm proud of y'all, man, and congratulations on this new venture. Man, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on, man. Giving man. us your time, bro. Thank y'all for having me. No doubt, man. Nah, but we appreciate you, man. Thanks for joining us on the show. Hey, appreciate you all for joining us on another edition of the Given Legends podcast. Check you out next week. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and comment on what inspires you to be a Given Legend in your community.